Okay, the morning Torah portion comes from Exodus chapter 6, verse 2, and it is called Va'era. And what does Va'era mean? I and I appeared. And it's very amazing when you analyze this. Let's start with Exodus 6, verse 2 and 3. The Lord. Now, you know the difference when it says God or the, when it says the Lord in the Old Testament? Whenever it says God, it's the Hebrew word Elohim. Whenever it says Lord, it's the Hebrew word, the yud Hey vav Hey or Yahweh. Okay? That's, and that's huge because in Genesis 1, it's God created the heavens and the earth. All of Genesis 1 is Elohim. Elohim, I mean, as you know, God has like 70-some names that describe him. Well, Elohim in Genesis 1 represents God as the king, the creator, the judge of all the earth. And then in Genesis 2, man is created, and all of a sudden he's introduced as the Lord God. So Elohim represents strict justice. Yudhe represents mercy. And so it goes from God in creation and strict justice to he's creating man. So now we see him as the merciful Elohim. Okay, so that is the difference. And so here we see it's the Yudhe Vave telling Moses. And he says, guess what? I'm going to show you what I'm going to do to Pharaoh. Ha <laughs> ha, you know. And he says, for by a strong hand, he will let them go. And by a strong hand, he's going to drive them out of his land. And then it says, uh, God spoke, see now it's Elohim, to Moses. And he said to him, I am the Lord, the youth. I am, I am merciful. But he just got to telling them how he's going to whip up on Pharaoh. And so we need to find out he's, he has strict justice, but also he has mercy. It's a two-edged sword. Just as he was judging Pharaoh with the Red Sea, killing them all, he was having mercy on his people, saving them all. And we have to understand that too, especially when we come into really rough times, troublous times and things like that. We know we have a merciful God. But look at what he says here. God, Elohim said, I am yud Vavhe. And I appeared, that's our Torah portion, I appeared to Abraham. It, now, who appeared to Abraham? Was it Elohim or the yud Vavhe? It was the yud Vavhe. Elohim is speaking, and he says, I am the yud Vavhe. The Lord just got done appearing, uh, you know, to Abraham. Uh, uh, I mean, sorry about that, to Moses. And he says, I appear to Abraham, I appear to Isaac, I appear to Jacob as El Shaddai. But by my name, the Yudevave, they never knew me. In other words, we can experience God in different relationships. He can be our judge. He can be our king. He can be our brother. He can be our friend. He can be our father. You following me? He can be our husband. Our goal in life should be to create as many bonds to the different relationships of God. Don't know him in just re one relationship and say, hey, I know him as my savior. Okay, great. Do you know him as your friend? Can you trust him? Can you rely on him? Do you know him as your brother who's going to help you in a time of need? So our life here on earth is creating as many different bonds to God as we possibly can. Now, it says Abraham and Isaac and Jacob never knew me as what? As Yahweh. Okay, what's the difference between Elohim and Yahweh then? Elohim is the one who gives the promises, and uh, Yudhe Vafe is the one who lets you experience. So they knew him as the promiser of the land, but they never received the land. They were strangers. They were sojourners the entire time. But look at this. 
the Lord actually did appear to them. Here he said he didn't, they didn't know that name, but I did appear to them. So let's look. In Genesis 12, 7, 8, it doesn't say God appeared to Abram. It says the Lord appeared to Abram. But he just got done saying they didn't know me as the Lord. Well, here it says the Lord appeared to Abram. And he said to your seed, okay, well, I give this land. And he built an altar to who? The Yud Havav, who appeared to him. And then he removed from there to a mountain on the east of Bethel, pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and high on the east. And there he built an altar to the Yud Havav. And he even called upon the name of Yud Havav, but he never experienced him as the Yud Havav. That sound confusing? Let me explain it to you this way. My dad was a tax accountant. I knew he was a tax accountant, but he never did my taxes. You following me? Okay, so here, I, you know, they, I appeared to them, but they never got to experience me as that. Does that help understand it? Okay, so now watch. In Genesis 17, 1 and 2, it says, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am El Shaddai. Walk before me, be blameless. See, that's the uh, El Shaddai, Elohim. This is the strict God. That I may make my covenant between me and you and may greatly multiply you. So we see here, the Lord did appear to Abraham. Well, look at this. He also appeared to Isaac. Genesis 26, 1 and 2. There was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. Isaac goes to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, to Gerar, and the yud heh appeared to him, saying, don't go down to Egypt, but dwell here. We also see the yud heh appeared to Jacob in Genesis 28, 12. Here, Jacob has a dream of a ladder being set up on earth, and the top reaches heaven, and angels were ascending and descending on it, and behold, the yud heh stood above it, and he tells Jacob, I am the merciful judge, okay? I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac. And where you lie to you, I will give this land into your seed. And then, <clears throat> I think it's interesting, Genesis 6, 3, again, he says, I appear to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, but by my name, the Lord, I wasn't known to them. Okay, so here's what's important. When God reveals one of his names, one of his names, it doesn't mean if we just figure out how to say it or pronounce it correctly, then we can manipulate them. I mean, for some people, they, there's the sacred name movement and they believe unless you say it exactly right, well, guess what? You can call him Oompa and he don't care. You know, if it's grandpa or grandma, all right, you don't have to pronounce his name exactly right in order for him to... Here, but the other thing, uh, let's see, God wants to reveal all of his different characters to us. And what's astounding about the law or the Tanakh, the Old Testament, did you know that God as Elohim or strict judge appears 2,500 times, but his characteristic as being merciful, the Lord, appears 7,000 times. Okay, so you see, he wants to represent himself more as the one who's merciful than the, the mighty Thor in the sky who throws lightning bolts at the people down below. Okay, which is how we so often uh, see him. Uh, he's, also, he's always known as the righteous lawgiver, the compassionate redeemer which also shows you how dispensationalism is so stupid. It's like God is bipolar, okay? He's really mean in the Old Testament, but oh, now he's so nice in the New Testament. God is not bipolar. Okay, let's go to Exodus 6 and look at verse 6 and 7. So what does he tell Moses? Say, therefore, to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. Okay, so he's speaking to the children of Israel, and look what he says. I'm going to bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from being slaves to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment, I will take you to be my people. Now, when Christians say they're saved, I always go, uh, saved from what? 
you know, what, what, what does that mean? What do you say? Oh, I'm saved from hell. Wrong. Matthew 121, they shall call his name Yeshua, for he shall save his people from their sins. But nobody wants to be saved from their sins. They love it. Just save me from the consequence of my sin. Oh, God, God saves me from the consequences of my sin, but he lets me keep my sin. I love it so much. Uh, redemption is not that. Redemption is a tire four step process. And you can't just claim one step and think you've crossed. So let's break this down. Okay, so here you go. Here they're slaves to Egypt. And he says, therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I'm the one who's going to redeem you. And look at what he says. He says four things here. Number one, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. That's step one. Step two, I will rescue you from their bondage. Step three, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. And number four, I will take you as my people. This is why at every Passover Seder, there are four cups to the complete redemption process. All right, um, let me see where I'm at here. All right, so let's take a, a look here. In Psalms 116, 13, in every English Bible, it's wrong. It says, I will take the cup of salvation, but it's salvations, plural, because it's a four-step process. It's not just one salvation. It's a process of four steps. So every Passover, there are four steps. Oh, I don't have this on my notes, so I'll just quote it to you. But you read in the Gospels when Yeshua is at the Last Supper, it says he takes one cup and he drinks it. And then in the same text there, it goes on and it says, and then he took the cup after supper. Well, there's actually, that shows you there's two cups, one before, one after, but there's actually four cups. So here's how it goes. The first one, when he says, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Here you, we have the weight. Think of Egyptians as the world or sin. And we have this burden of our sins, that this load we've been carrying. And God says, to cast all your cares where? On him. Okay. And it says, I will bring you. So the first cup is called the cup of sanctification where God picks you. He could have picked anybody. He didn't have to pick Israel, but he decided to pick Israel and redeem them from their bondage. So that's called the cup of sanctification. Even though your burdens have been lifted, you're still chained to Egypt. God may have taken care of your problems, but guess what? You're still in chains and you're still in Egypt. And so here you are chained and he wants to also rescue you from your bondage. Okay, so the first step is the step of sanctification. The next cup is the cup of deliverance where he ch takes the chains away, which would be like, our sinful habits were chained to him. God may save us, but we still have some habitual sin we're struggling with. So God says, I also want to break that bondage so you're free from that horrible habit, whatever it may be. But guess what the problem is? They're still in Egypt. Your burdens are lifted. You've been set free, but you're still in Egypt. So the third cup is I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to pay the price, Okay to take care of you with an outstretched arm. And I can't help but think of the outstretched arms of Messiah on the cross to redeem us. And that cup is known as the cup of redemption. So the first thing, God, you can't, how many of you know they couldn't free themselves in Egypt? And we can't get ourselves out of our sins. That's why you can't clean your act up before you come to God because that will never work. Okay, so he uh, sanctifies you and says, okay, I'm going to choose you. Then what does he do? He breaks our bondages to the world, but we're still in the world. So then he pays the price by redeeming us, okay? But the problem is we're still in Egypt after he's paid the price. So it's time to go, all right? So here they all go and they're on the other side and they see the water closing in on the Egyptians. And that brings us to the fourth cup, which is called the cup of acceptance, where he says, I'm gonna take you as my People. Now, you may have 
a horrible situation where you get a flat tire on the highway and some nice soul comes and fix your tire. That doesn't mean they want to marry you, okay? So here's the thing. Not on, this is what's so amazing. Not only does God take our burdens, not only does he uh, set us free, not only does he pay the price so that we can be redeemed, he says, I want to marry you. I want to take you as my people. That is huge. And, and, and so he takes them and what does he do? Dump them in the wilderness? No, he stays with them. That's what he wants to do. He wants to be a part of their life. Now, how many of you know God doesn't need anything? So why did he create us? Did he need us? Uh, he wanted a relationship. That's exactly what he wanted, a relationship. He, how many of you know, sometimes you are just so filled with blessing and happiness, you just have to share it with somebody. Well, God is so, he doesn't need us, but he wants someone that he can show his love to. That's what it's about. Okay, so what's important about this concept? How many of you know sometimes we all want to be loved, we all want to be needed, but how many of you want a needy person? <laughs> I mean, you don't want someone to suck the energy out of you though either. You know what I mean? And so, but what's amazing when you realize this, he did not need a relationship with us. He wanted a relationship with us. That's huge. He wanted her. He didn't have a need. We don't fulfill any of his needs. He wanted a relationship with us. This should show you just how important it is for us to build that relationship with him. Okay, Exodus 7, 5. He says, the Egyptians are going to know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand upon Egypt and bring you guys out from among them. Now, what many of us uh, believers, Christians don't know is every single plague in Egypt was a plague on one of the gods of Egypt. Yeah, watch this. We're going to have this all unfold here. Um, see. Uh, in Genesis, at the creation, we see the God of creation is above creation, right? He created it. He's not created. He created it. He's apart from it. And he rules over nature. God rules over nature. While the God of the Bible is concerned with good and evil and with bringing justice, nature itself is amoral. I mean, the wind isn't good or the wind isn't bad. It's just the wind. Okay. And therefore, it's not worthy of worship. Okay. Man worships nature. How dumb. Because why does man want to worship nature? Why? Nature doesn't tell them what to do. You ain't the boss of me. They want to worship something that won't tell them what to do. Okay, let's go to Exodus 7, 8 through 10. Then the Lord says to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, prove yourself by working a miracle. Now look at this. This is important to see the distinction. Moses is to tell Aaron to take his staff. Moses doesn't take his staff. Moses tells Aaron to take his own staff and cast it down before Pharaoh that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants and it became a serpent. How many have heard that before? How many of you know that's wrong? <laughs> okay, back at the burning bush, Moses took his staff, threw it down, and it became a serpent. And the Hebrew word for serpent is nakash. But guess what? He tells Aaron to throw down his rod, and it becomes a tanaim. Well, that's not nakash. It doesn't become a serpent like everybody thinks. You go and even look it up on Google, and it became a crocodile. 
That's what it became, a crocodile. But everyone takes this completely different Hebrew word and translates it as serpent. All right. So now, Exodus 7, 20. Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded, and he lifted up the rod, and he smote the waters that were in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, and the waters that were in the river turned to blood. Why did it turn to blood? The Nile was a god, and turning it to blood symbolized the death of that particular god. Okay, plus they had thrown all the babies in the Nile, turning it to blood. Now, Exodus 8, 1 through 3. And this is what the Lord said to Moses. Go to Pharaoh and say to him, the Lord says, let my people go so that they may give me worship. And if you won't let them go, I'm going to send what? Frogs everywhere. Okay. And uh, they'll be in every part of your land. The Nile will be full of frogs. And they're going to come up into your houses and even into your bedrooms and on your bed. And into the houses of your servants and your people, and into your ovens, into your bread basins. So here's a nice picture of the frogs up here in their bedrooms. Frogs are everywhere. And then in Exodus 8, verse 6 and 7, Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs over the land of Egypt. You know what I tell them? You idiot, you're supposed to get rid of them, not add to it. I mean, talk about brain dead. Well, I can do that too, so let's just create more frogs. I, you know, that was really smart. Uh, but you know, that shows you the power of hate. The power of hate. I mean, there, uh, you can just be so hateful and everything will just return on your own head. And so in Exodus 8 and verse Eight, what do we find? Then Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron and said, make a prayer to the Lord that he'll take away these stinking frogs for me and my people and I'll let the people go and make their offering to the Lord. Hmm, why doesn't he ask his magicians to do that? I think because he knows there is no control over this. And then in Exodus 8, 9, Moses said, I will let you have the honor of saying when I am to make a prayer for you and your servants and your people that the frogs may be sent away from you and your houses and be only in the Nile. I think that's amazing. He says, oh, in other words, I mean, you would think Pharaoh would like, I'll take the honor and remove him. But he says, no, I'll let you have the honor. You just tell me when, you know, and we'll take care of it for you. You know, in one sense, Moses is acting like a, the little card trick musician saying, pick a card, any card. What, you know, what do you want to do here? And then look at what they say in Exodus 8, 19. The magicians go to Pharaoh and they say, this is the finger of God. And Moses thinking, wait till you see his whole hand. <laughs> if you think the finger is something, you know. Uh, in Exodus 8, Let's look at verse 25 and 26. So Pharaoh sends for Moses and Aaron, and he says, go and make your offering to your God here. Notice he says, do it here. I don't want you going nowhere. You do it right here in the land. And Moses says, sorry, can't do that. For if we make our offerings of that to which the Egyptians worship, in other words, if we go and kill your gods, uh, your people aren't going to be too happy. We have to do this out of here. And he says, if we do so before their eyes, certainly we're going to be stoned. In other words, we have to slaughter and sacrifice your gods in order to properly serve our God. You know what that means? No assimilation. No syncretism. Okay, uh, you can't serve both gods. Uh, how do you know who is your God? It's where you spend your time. Do you spend your time in front of your iPhone? Do you spend your time in front of your TV? Where do you, where do you spend your time? That is really what it comes down to. Now, uh, one of the things 
that's interesting. I'll share this with you. Uh, it's going to be coming later, but I kind of like it. Do you remember that the Egyptians worshipped the lamb? The lamb was one of their gods, right? As a matter of fact, Passover happened in the month of uh, Ares, which is over Egypt, when they could see it. And the Egyptians believed it was at the full moon of that month, okay, which is when Passover took place, April 14th, 15th. It's the middle of the month. It's always the full moon. They believe that's when uh, their God was at its greatest strength, at the full moon. Now we, that's, that's at, it's at the apex of his power. Now, how many of you like to smell barbecue food? You're outside and you're, all of a sudden you smell the neighbor barbecuing. You're not barbecuing, but you can sure smell the smell of that barbecuing. Oh, so good. What does God have Israel do He asked them to have an outside barbecue and cook the lamb so all the Egyptians could smell they're cooking their God. (laughs) Barbecue! And the air is wafting over Egypt and they're smelling this giant barbecue as they're killing their God. And then he says, and you know what? I want you to slap the blood on the outside of their door so they know who sacrificed their God when they come to get you. I don't ever thought about that. I mean, here they're all smelling, they're killing our God. Can you imagine what the Muslims would do if something like that happened today? I mean, this is the situation that they were in back then. And so here they're slaughtering their God during when it's supposed to be at the apex of its strength. Then they're putting the blood on it outside the door so they'll all know who killed their God. Okay, so I I just wanted to give you another setting of what's going on at Passover. Okay. In other words, they had to, in order to serve my God, I got to kill all of my other gods I had before. We we don't want to kill our other gods. We want to imprison it and then go visit it. (laughs) God says, no, you got to kill it. Do you know what repent means in Hebrew? It's, it, it does mean to go another direction, but let's say over here is home and I'm going this way and I turn around and I go this way. No, it means to go home. Repent means to go home. Not just turn around, you could turn around. How many remember, uh, what is it, Family Circle, the newspaper where they have all the people running all different directions? That's what some people think repentance is, just going a different direction? No, go home to your dad who's calling for you. But here's the deal. Do you know what the Hebrew word for repent is? Shuv, which is the shin and the bait. Now, what? does the letter shin represent? It looks like fangs. It means to consume, to destroy. One of God's names is El Shaddai. It begins with the letter shin. Okay, this is why on every mezuzah on the doorpost of the house has a letter shin on the mezuzah for Shaddai, but it means to consume, like our God is a consuming fire. The letter bait means what in Hebrew? House. Bethlehem is house of bread. So the bread of life was born in the city called the house of bread. Okay. Now, repent means to burn the house down. Shuv, burn it down so you can't go back and then go home where you belong. That's what repentance means. Okay. Okay. Now, in Exodus 9, let's jump over there to verse 34. When Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. Well, now, if you remember from last week, those of you that were here, I used to think, wow, this isn't fair. God hardens Pharaoh's heart and then, wow, and then expects him. Does that sound fair? No. 
Well, guess what? The problem is English. All right. There are two different hardens, two different Hebrew words, but we use one English word for both and it's completely wrong. When we think of the word of his heart being hardened, we find Pharaoh hardens his heart several times in the Bible, okay? And uh, you guys, you got this word that means to harden. That is when Pharaoh hardens his own heart like that. But whenever it says the Lord hardens his heart, it's another word, it's kazak. It's, okay, and what does kazak mean? It means to strengthen. Kavod, kaved, is to harden, to make weighty, like God's glory is kaved. It's weighty, it comes down, God's weight, kaved. Okay, so Pharaoh kavods his own, or kaveds his own heart. He makes it hard as a rock. But whenever it says the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, it's not that word. It's kazak, which means to strengthen it so he can continue. Think of a boxing match I mentioned last week where Pharaoh and God are in a boxing match and Pharaoh's been hardening his own heart. He's so mad and he's so hateful and then he's ready to give up. And so God, when he hardens his heart as missing translated, he goes to the corner and says, oh, Pharaoh, no, come on. I got three more plagues. Get up, get up. Here's some water. You know, here's some food. God never hardens Pharaoh's heart to take away his free will. He strengthens his heart so he can continue on his path. But this is what, you, you have to understand the Hebrew words and the Hebrew definitions. God never hardened Pharaoh's heart. Okay. Um, God specializes in saving people from slavery, which means he specializes in saving people from their sin. The problem is we don't want to be saved from our sin. We want to be saved in our sin so we can continue it. I think it's interesting, the Haftorah, which is the part that goes with the Torah portion, this is a thousand years after this event. Here, Pharaoh lets them go, Moses takes them out, and a thousand years later, how many of you know God knows our heart? He knows our heart. We can't fool, how many of you know you can't fool God? So, I mean, just forget it. Just go to him and say, I'm sorry. Okay. A thousand years later, look at the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28, verse 25 and 26. Thus said the Lord God, when I will have gathered the house of Israel from the people among whom they are scattered and will be sanctified in them in the sight of the heathen, then shall they dwell in their land that I have given to my servant Jacob and they shall dwell safely therein. They shall build houses, plant vineyards. They'll dwell with confidence. When I have executed judgments on all those that despise them around about them, and they will know that I am the Lord their God. So we find in the Exodus, and you're going to find next week when I go through it, every time he executes judgments against one of their gods. Okay? And that's how the world knows that God is real. Well, here we see the same thing is going to happen in the very near future, near a planet near you, when God is going to execute judgments against every one of the gods of today. Be that the movie theater, the sports, whatever the God is, God is going to be executing judgments specifically against each one of those. And next week, I'm going to show you each God of each one of the plagues and how God handled it. Now, one of the other verses that comes to my mind that's not in your notes, that's really sad, is back in Ezekiel, God talks about the events of the Exodus when they cross the Red Sea to go into the Promised Land. He says, every one of you carried your pagan gods with you. Here, if you remember, they were in such a rush, they only had time to bake bread and they left, 
But in Ezekiel, they took their pagan gods with them as they ran. You see that in the book of Exodus. And how many of us, when we are saved, takes some of our sins with us as we go? And God wants us not to imprison it, but to kill it. <laughs> and that's really what we need to do. Uh, with that, let's stand. And uh, we'll say a prayer. And then we'll have a you know, 15-minute break downstairs. We have all kinds of hot coffee to warm up your chilling body and uh, some snacks. And then we'll have like 15 minutes of worship. And then I'll be back. Avinu Mokenu, our Father of King, we just thank you so much that we can come and worship you. Father, do open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts that we cannot, we won't be the frog in the boiling water, not knowing what's happening. But Father, we would know the signs of the times and know what time it is, and it's time to wake up. We thank you, Lord, for all those that are here locally, for all those around the United States, for all those around the world that are live streaming with us right now. And we just thank you for any tithes or offerings that come, not necessarily to us. It all goes to the Lord. We're, we're, we're just a, a funnel, a hose, so to speak, to allow the glory of the Lord to flow through. And we just thank you that you, too, love the Lord so much. You want to see him glorified at this time. Uh, through your tithes and offerings in Yeshua's name. Amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Uh, and so now we're going to talk about the second half. Uh, I even got an email saying, you know, I am kind of new to all this. Help me understand the biblical calendar. So I'm going to show you just how significant the biblical calendar is. And we're going to begin on your notes with Genesis 1.14. Let me see something here. Okay. It says that God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs, seasons, days, and years. Okay, so God created the sun and the moon for signs, seasons, days, and years. Years. Now, let's take a look at Genesis 5, 3 through 5. How old did Adam live? 130 years. He begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years. And he begat sons and daughters, and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years. Do you realize, uh, think, what does that mean? That means they had a calendar. How would they know how long they lived unless there was a working calendar back then? Adam and Eve had a calendar. And that wasn't the Gregorian. The Gregorian calendar is based on what? The sun. Very mathematical, very scientific, but it's not what God uses. The Muslim calendar is based on what? The moon. Very scientifically accurate lunar calendar. But it's not the one God uses. God does not consult them. He created one that's based on the sun and the moon. So when it gives the number of years that everyone lives, it is based on that calendar. Now, the Chinese are one of the nations that actually use a solar lunar calendar. So theirs is much more accurate, but there's a big problem. They worship a different God. So God doesn't use their calendar. 
So the biblical dates are based on a biblical calendar that Adam and Eve knew. They knew that. How else would we know how long they lived? Now, if you remember several months ago, I talked about the Roman calendar. Okay, you had the Gregorian calendar that was based on the Julian calendar that was based on the ancient Roman calendar. And guess what? They found that it was all screwed up because they were only using the sun. And the vernal equinox was happening 11 days later. So they go, oh my goodness, we got to adjust this thing. So they, there's all these adjustments. Okay, well, get a load of this. Now, how many of you heard the uh, phrase, if a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? Of course it does. The birds hear it. The dogs hear it. The animals hear it. God hears it. Well, here's the question. If the creator creates a calendar for mankind to use just because the United States doesn't recognize it, does that mean God's calendar doesn't exist? Of course it exists. It's always existed from the beginning. Okay, so let's take a look at another verse. In Jeremiah 25, verse 11 and 12, Jeremiah says, this whole land will be a desolation and astonishment, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon how many years? 70 years. And it'll come to pass when the 70 years are accomplished, God says, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, says the Lord, for their iniquity, and the land of the Chaldeans, and will make it a perpetual desolation. Now, that's what Jeremiah said. But where did Jeremiah get that from? He got it from Leviticus. Look at chapter 25, verse 1 through 4. The Lord speaks to Moses in Mount Sinai, and he said, Tell the children of Israel, when you come into the land that I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Now, what does that mean? The land gets to rest for a whole year. Just like every six days we work and the seventh day we rest, God says the land, you get to work it for six years and then the land gets to rest for a year. It's also an economic reset for people that are in debt. This is where we get our seven year bankruptcy law from. Okay, it's from the idea that after seven years, the land rests and it's an economic reset. And it goes on to say six years, you'll sow your field Six years you'll prune your vineyard and gather in the fruit, but in the seventh year will be a Sabbath of rest to who? The land. It's a Sabbath for the Lord, and I don't want you sowing your field or pruning your vineyard. So every seven years, the land was to have a Sabbath. Now, look what it goes on to say in verse 8 through 11. Not only every seven years, which is the Shemitah, cycle is seven years. The seventh year is the Shemitah year. Look what it says in Leviticus 25, 8 through 11. I want you to number seven Sabbaths of years unto you, seven times seven, and the space of seven Sabbaths of years will be unto you 49 years. What is seven times seven? How many of you knew God knew math? Okay. And then it says, you will cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seventh month, which is Yom Kippur, in the Day of Atonement. You are to make the trumpet sound throughout all the land, and you shall hallow the 50th year, and you are to proclaim liberty throughout all the land, to all the inhabitants. It'll be a Jubilee. You will return every man to his possession, and you'll return every man to his family. A Jubilee shall be the 50th year to you. Okay, so seven times seven is... So God created 49-year cycles, 49 years, 49 years, 49 years, 49 years, over and over. When it says the 50th year, that wasn't a separate year in the middle of the blocks of seven. The 50th year was the first year of the next seven-year times seven-year block. You following me? Just like Sunday is the first day of the week, but it's also the eighth day because you got the first seven days, you know, you got Friday, or I mean, you have Sunday through Saturday, and then Sunday is the eighth day, but it's also the first day of the next week. 
There's not an extra day called Jumba Day that they make the 50th. Oops. So <clears throat> this tells you what time it is. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. Look at this. In Leviticus, okay, it says that they're to hallow the 50th year and do what? Proclaim liberty. But guess what? They proclaim liberty not only in the 50th year, they were to proclaim liberty every seven years. The Shemitah year, they were to proclaim liberty. Now, you're going to see why that is important here in a little bit. Let me make sure I have that. Yeah, okay. So, Second Chronicles, look at this, chapter 36, verse 20 and 21. It talks about those who had escaped from the sword, carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. And it says to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath. For as long as she lay desolate, she got to keep her Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. Okay, what does that mean mathematically? They were to proclaim liberty every, liberty every seventh year. But guess what happens? They never did that for 490 years. For 490 years, they never allowed this land to rest in the seventh year. Okay, and 490 divided by seven is 70. That's why the land got to rest for 70 years to make up for the 490 years when it didn't get a rest every seventh year. Okay, does everyone understand? The seventh year is the Shemitah year. Okay, a seven-year Shemitah cycle. The seventh year is the Shemitah year. They never kept it for 490 years. So the land got a rest all at once the 70 years it got to miss, which tells us the Shemitah cycle is very important to God. That's why they were in Babylon for 70 years. Now look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years where the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So we see here, Jeremiah is reading the Torah and Jeremiah goes, gee, we were supposed to do this. We haven't done it. So therefore it's gonna rest for 70 years. Now, how many of you know Daniel was Jewish? I know that may be a shock, but he was. And so look at uh, here's the thing to realize. Daniel goes, wow, the reason I'm here in Babylon is because our country never kept the Shemitah cycle. Does that make sense? Which the Gregorian calendar could care less about. So look at Daniel 9, 24. And notice this is in the same chapter. Some connections are being made. And it, Daniel says, well, an angel's telling Daniel, 70 weeks. Now, in the Bible, we have a seven-day week, but we just read there's weeks of years. So when it says 70 weeks are determined, that means 70 sevens. And what 70 times seven? 490. That we just got done talking about, that they never kept the Shemitah cycle. And so Daniel's saying, guess what? There's another 490 year cycle that's very important that God's concerning about, not only in the past, but in the future. And what do we see? The purpose is, this is to be determined upon your people, Israel, your holy city, Jerusalem. And the purpose is to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make a reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now, how many of you know all of that has not happened? Okay, there's still sin. All right, uh, everlasting righteousness has not been brought in. Okay, so that means there's 490 years that were determined. Now, most people that have studied prophecy knows 
that that is broken up into segments of years and there is one week of seven years left, right? And that's why the tribulation is seven years, which is one week according to a seven-year Smita cycle. And now look at Daniel 9, 27. He will confirm the covenant with many for how long? One week. Okay, so most of the 490 years are gone by, but there's one week that's been set apart and in the midst of the week, he'll cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease for the overspreading of abominations. He'll make it desolate even until the consummation. And that determination shall be poured out upon the desolate. Okay, I want you to take a look at this calendar. This is what I created. And I don't know if anyone in history has ever done this, but I have put together every Shemitah cycle and Jubilee cycle clear back to creation. Anyone can look at this calendar that I created, which is in my new book coming up, to see exactly when historical events happened according to the biblical calendar. Now, what you see here, I want to go, this is where we're at right now. We just celebrated the 118th Jubilee, and this goes from 2022, 2023 to 2028, 2029, because that is a seven year cycle. Each square is seven years. So the whole row, seven times seven is 49 years. So that is a Jubilee cycle. The Jubilee was in the year 5783 from creation. We're now in 5784, right? Well, 5783 was our years, 2022 to 2023. The seventh year is 5789, and it will be 2028, 2029 on our calendar. Does everyone understand? Seven years from 2022 to 2028, when you include 2022, all right? I also have on here that this is the 118th Jubilee. It's also the 827th Shemitah cycle. There's been 827 Shemitah cycles since creation. That's, everything is on this chart. And then here we go. Now, it was the 117th Jubilee, which was the year 5734, which was the year 1973, which was the Yom Kippur War literally happened on the first day of the Jubilee cycle. So you can go back and see when events happened as you go. Okay? I want to make sure everyone understands how each square is seven years. Each row is a Jubilee cycle. And I let you know from creation how many Jubilee cycles have gone by, how many Shemitah cycles have gone by. Why is this important? Okay. We're going to keep going back here for a minute. The United States became a nation in 1776, which happened to be a Shemitah year going into a Jubilee year. Wow, the United States, we can look and see exactly when it happened among the Shemitah cycles, among the Jubilee cycles, so it was huge that we were created at the end of a Shemitah year going into a Jubilee year. I think that's powerful. Now, here we go. When was Jesus born? I can tell you exactly when he was born, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Okay, what do we see here? The 76th Jubilee takes us right over to where Yeshua was born in the year 3757. Now we see the first year of the Shemitah cycle was 8 to 7 BC. The seventh year, 3759. So he was born in the 3757. So that's two years before 3759. So he was born in the year 4 BC going into 3 BC. Is everyone following me? But look at this. This is incredible. Yeshua started his ministry, it says in the Bible, when he was 30 years old. Uh, look at Luke 3.23 on your notes. 
Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. Okay. If he was born in 4 BC, 30 years later is going to be 26 AD, right? 26 plus 4 is 30. So he began his ministry in the year, the fall of the year 26. He ministered for three and a half years, so he dies in the spring of 30 AD at the age of 33. Following me? 33 and a half. Okay. It so happens here, he's born and ministering during the 77th Jubilee cycle. Isn't that amazing? It's the 77th Jubilee cycle. He starts his ministry in a Shemitah year. This is why he stood up in uh, Luke 4, 17 through 19, a scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll, found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor and to, he sent me to do what? Proclaim liberty, which is what you do in a Shemitah year, which is why he's in the Shemitah year and he reads I'm here to fulfill this prophecy. And he began his ministry in the fall when the cycle changes. Does that, all that make sense? Now here is what is absolutely incredible. Let me see. Boom. Okay, Matthew 10, five and six. The 12 apostles, Jesus sent them forth, commanded them saying, go, do not go into any way of the Gentiles or into any city of Samaritans. Don't go there. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 15, 24. He answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Does everyone understand where he was sent? Now, he was sent to Israel. Here is the word Israel in Hebrew. What is the numerical value of Israel? When you look at it, 541. The shin is 300. The race is 200. There's 500. And then you see the 41. And who was he sent to? The lost sheep of the house of Israel. What is the numerical value of Israel? 541. Okay, get a load of this. He started in the 541st meeting year. Because he was sent to the house of Israel, which is 541. You're not going to get this on any Gregorian calendar. This is the perfect biblical calendar, completely mathematical. Do you see that? Okay. Isn't this fun? Okay, now. Look at Jeremiah 34, verse 14 and 15. Jeremiah is saying, and here's what happened in chapter 34. If they hadn't served God or they have not obeyed the Shemitah year for 490 years. Is that right? They never kept the seventh year. Now, what is amazing about this? In Jeremiah 34, how many of you know when things go wrong, people turn to God. If they're going good, God, you just stay away. I have you in my pocket. I'll pull you out when I need you. Okay? Wow. So guess what the king does, King Zedekiah? He goes, oh my goodness, let's honor this meeting here and proclaim liberty and God will show mercy. So they decided to keep the Shemitah year and they announced it. They proclaimed liberty to everybody and at the same time, Egypt came to help Israel fight off Babylon, and Babylon left. And Egypt left. And Israel gave the credit to Egypt, not to God. And so they went, after they had freed everybody, put them back into bondage again. Which is why in Jeremiah 34, in your notes, 14 and 15, it says, at the end of seven years, you're to let go every man his brother a Hebrew, which has been sold to you. And when he has served you six years, you shall let him go 
free from you. But your fathers did not listen, neither inclined their ear, and you have now repented, and you've done what is right in my sight, in proclaiming liberty every man to his neighbor, and you have made a covenant before me in the house which is called by my name. And it goes on, and God says, but because you've turned, I'm now going to proclaim liberty to you. Proclaim liberty to the sword, to war, to judgment. And the next year, the temple was destroyed because they didn't keep the Shemitah cycle. And now Daniel's reading Jeremiah and he's saying, oh my goodness, the whole reason we're in Babylon is because we haven't been proclaiming liberty every seven years. Okay, <clears throat> now again, Daniel was Jewish. What does that mean? That means that there's one week left, which is the seven year tribulation as we know it, but Christianity doesn't understand Daniel was Jewish. The seven years cannot start any day. The seven years cannot start any year. It's a Shemitah cycle. The tribulation has to start at the beginning of a new Shemitah cycle. This is why we have to know the Shemitah cycle so we know when the possibilities of the tribulation beginning. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, let me show you some other things. On this chart that I have, here <clears throat> is the dates, not only from Adam, but the Gregorian dates. Year one, Adam and Eve are created, okay? 1,656 years later, which on our calendars, 2105, 2104, that's when Noah's flood happened. It was in 2105 BC. 1948 is when Abraham was born. Imagine that. This becomes a nation in 1948, and in 1948 is when Abraham was born. Here's the I have Bible verses for all of these guys. That was the year 1813, 1812 BC. Then 2023, which we just ended, is when the land of Israel was promised to Abraham, and it happened on Passover. Before Passover was instituted, it was that day that the land was promised to Abraham. In the year 2048, which was our 1713 BC, Isaac is born. In the year 2108, which is our 1653, Jacob is born. Abraham, uh, or Isaac is 60, Abraham is 160, and guess what? It was a year of Jubilee. Jacob was born in a year of Jubilee. And then we go on and we see in the year 2238 is when Jacob enters Egypt at 130 years old. And it was exactly 215 years from the promise being given. And then get a load of this in 1506, 1505 BCE, Jacob dies at 147 in a year of Jubilee. Jacob was literally born in a year of Jubilee. He died in a year of Jubilee. And then Joseph dies in 1452, 1451. Levi is the last one of the tribes to die. Okay, and that was in 1431, 1430. We even know the exact year Moses was born in 1388, 1387. All this is from the Bible. Instead of trying to go forward and go backward, just start at the beginning and go forward. What a concept. 2453, which is 1308, Moses is now 80. They leave Egypt on Passover exactly 215 years from entering, which was 215 years from the promise, which is 430 years. There's a Bible verse that says exactly on the very day, 430 years later is when they left. They left on Passover. Abraham receives the promise of the land on Passover. What a concept. Now here, I take those few squares and I break them out into a real big. So here is when they, Isaac dies, Israel enters Egypt. Here is the 215 years Israel is in Egypt. And I think it's interesting, they leave Egypt in the 50th Jubilee cycle. What a concept, okay? And then they're in the wilderness for 40 years, so they enter the promised land in the year 2493, which was the first year of a new Shemitah cycle, which is why also in the first year of a new Shemitah cycle, we just may go meet God. In the first year of a Shemitah cycle is when the tribulation begins. 
But anyway, once you are on God's calendar, you don't take the Gregorian calendar and try to make the biblical calendar line up with it because the Gregorian calendar is out of plumb. You try, if you want to do anything, you've got to make it fit into the biblical calendar that's in plumb. Okay, so now, in my book that'll be out here next month, I literally have every Shemitah year, every Jubilee year from 50 years from now, all the way back to Adam and Eve. So you can look at every historical event and look at when it actually happened, and you're gonna find out this is gonna be huge. But here, in 2889, which was 872, 871, David becomes king at 30 years old. And then Solomon becomes king. Rehoboam becomes king. Abijah becomes, I have the list of every king of Israel all the way to the destruction of the temple with the, it's so easy to date when you just start at the beginning and use what the Bible says for numerics. Now here's what is going to be mind blowing for everybody, which is why this book is gonna be so huge. Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh, Am. I have all the years, both BC and from Adam. But okay, when do they say the temple was destroyed? What year? No, the first temple. They almost everyone says 587, 586. Wrong. It was destroyed in 399, 400 BC. Everyone's off 100 some years. And I can prove it that it would happen in the year 3361 just by counting the years from Adam to when it was destroyed. And then you go from now, 5784, 2024, and you go backwards, and that lines up exactly with when the temple was destroyed. So the temple was not destroyed in 587, 586, but it was destroyed in the year 400. Okay, now let's take another look. Here is just a random set of 10 seven-year cycles. Seven, or I mean, jubilee cycles. There's the jubilee cycles, which is seven sevens. Each square is seven, okay? Uh, but here I break it down. Instead of being one box being seven years, I bring out every year. So I've magnified it, right? There are people out there who think 2017 was a jubilee year in 1967, in 1917. Completely and absolutely, biblically, mathematically impossible. You can't say 2017 is a jubilee year. Number one, God doesn't use the Gregorian calendar. Hello, okay. 2017 is the year 5777, but it's also the year 5778. So if someone says 2017 is a jubilee year, you gotta say, what has? because the biblical calendar doesn't start on January 1st, okay? It starts on Rosh Hashanah. So there is no, how can 2017 be a Jubilee year? Number one, when God doesn't use the Gregorian calendar, how in the world could anyone have figured out what year it was in Jeremiah's time when the Gregorian calendar wasn't even around? Okay, but not only that, it's in the middle of a Shemitah cycle. The Jubilee year has to follow a Shemitah year. Therefore, the Jubilee year would have to be the first year somewhere in a Shemitah cycle. Now, I have 10 cycles of seven years. How do we know when the first year of a Jubilee starts? Okay, well, it's called math. 5733 AM is divisible by seven. That's how we know it's a Shemitah year. Isn't that difficult? We also know the following year will be a Jubilee year because 5733 is also divisible by 49. The way you know when the Shemitah cycles and the Jubilee cycles is simply see if the year is divisible by seven. That's how you know. If it's divisible by 49, the next year is the 50th year. Okay, does that sound difficult? <clears throat> so we see again 1973, not the spring, but the fall, when Rosh Hashanah is, began a jubilee year. And a jubilee year is seven sevens. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And ta-da, 2022, 2023 is a jubilee year. How do we know 
because 5782 is divisible by 7 and divisible by 49. And you'll see that is your set of seven years of the calendar. It's so fun using math because it's simple. Okay. Now, watch this. Drum roll. Are you ready? Again, here we are. Down here. Oh, I forgot to show you something. Let me go back for a second. Let me. Ah, oh well. I think it's, uh, let me just look. Oh, well. Okay, here we are. <clears throat> we're in, we just celebrated the 118th Jubilee, which means we're in the 119th Jubilee. We're in the 827th Shemitah cycle, right? Let's see. Look at Hosea chapter 5, verse 14 through 6 3. This is a prophecy. Listen to what God says. First off, a day with the Lord is how many years? So two days would be. Let's look at Hosea 5.14. God is speaking through Hosea in a prophecy. I'm going to be to Ephraim as a lion and as a young lion to the house of Judah. I, the Lord, even I am going to tear them apart like a lion and go away. <clears throat> I will take away and no one will rescue him. Now look at this. I'm going to go and return to my place. That means he left his place. This is Yeshua who came to earth. Israel and Judah got torn apart. And then he says, I'm going to go on to return to my place until they acknowledge their offense, which is why Yeshua's closing words were, okay, Baruch Haba, B'Shem Adonai, I'm not coming back until you say, blessed is the name of the Lord, okay? Okay, and then look, what, and that's Yom Kippur. This event will happen on Yom Kippur. Okay, and what are Israel going to say? Come, let us return to the Lord. Yes, he has torn us, but he will heal us. Yes, he has spanked us, but he's going to bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. Israel becomes a nation in 1948. All right. But wait, there's more. The third day, he will raise us up and we will live in his sight. The third day is the third millennium from his death. And the millennial rain day begins and we live in his sight while he's right here on earth. So this verse is saying he's going to spank us. Then he's going to go and go back to heaven. After 2000 years, we are going to come back to life. We're going to be raised up and live in his sight while he rules and reigns on earth for a thousand years. That's what this is saying. And then it says, the third day he'll raise us up. We'll live in a sight. Then we're going to know if we follow on to know the Lord is going forth as prepared as the morning. He'll come to us as the rain, as the latter and former rain into the earth. When it says latter rain and former rain, he's talking about the spring feast and the fall feast. Now, here he goes. When did he die? In the year 30, right? Well, guess what? We are right now entering the third year of the Shemitah cycle, 2024 through 25. That's what we'll have. We'll begin this Rosh Hashanah. Fourth year, fifth year, sixth year, seventh year, and then the eighth year or the first year of the new Shemitah cycle is 2030. And if you take 30 AD to 2030, you have the 2,000 years, and more than likely, this is when the tribulation begins. We have about four or five years to get ready until the tribulation begins, and this begins the third millennium. Well, he will raise us up and we'll live in his sight. We've got about five years left until the tribulation begins, and we're going to see wars over the next five years. This is what my book is about, okay? Now, how many of you know the October 7th Israel war, okay? What happens? What did Hamas do to the Israelis that they captured or killed? They chopped their heads off. They chopped their body parts off. 
In my book, I talk about how Hamas is Amalek along with Iran and their proxies. Do you know what Amalek, the name Amalek means? Am is nation or people. Amalek is the nation that chops off heads, that chops off body parts. So what do we know? Amalek like Hamas, that's the time we're living in. And God said he will have war with Amalek to every generation, okay? Right now, in this next five years that we have left, is what my book is about, I'm going to show you how this will be the final generation that battles Amalek. This is it. And that's what we're going to be seeing over the next few years. And then he's going to raise us up and we'll live in his sight. We got about five years. Thank you. Let's stand.